Um, hello and welcome to today's Constructing Confidence, How to Combat Imposter Syndrome. My name is Gabby Dominguez and I have the pleasure of serving as the program manager for Student Life here in University Life. Now, before we get started, I wanna take this time to do a land acknowledgement created by Columbus School of Nursing. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Nelape people on which we learn, work and gather here today. Nelape means real person or original person. And it's important to remember that Nelape collectively are a living and breathing community. Let us honor the legacy. Let us commit ourselves to the struggle against the forces that have dispossessed the Nelape people and other indigenous people of their lands. We stand in, in strong commitment, support, and defend all marginalized people of this land who has been stripped of the rights to their determination. Thank you, Columbia Nursing School for issuing this acknowledgement. Whether you're seeking to promote racial justice and ally or you identify as native or indigenous, or in seek resources, we invite you to visit our resources for combating Native America indigenous racism, which I've been shared um, in our chat, as well as um, more to find about local indigenous territories and languages and which you're sitting on today. So both have a happy end to the chat. Again, thanks so much for joining today. This, this event is part of University Life Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, which promotes Columbia's commitment to the diversity and success of all graduate students and professional students. Now, before I introduce our amazing facilitator, please know um, this, this session, it will be recorded. If you have any issues with that, please chat us and we could, we could stop the recording if needed um, if we get to the Q&A. Now, let me introduce our amazing facilitator. Please notice a very short and abbreviated bio of Dr. Worthy. She has achieved tremendous accomplishment and I encourage you all to look uh, more into her after today's event. We'll also share in the chat um, her website and more about her. So Dr. Keisha Worthy is a doctor level and experienced psychologist located here in Manhattan. She helps individuals overcome underlying issues and unhealthy patterns. She specializes in anxiety, depression, trauma, gender and sexuality, and race-related stress and addiction. Dr. Worthy earned her, both her bachelor's and master's degree at Wilson-Salem State University and a doctor degree in counseling psychology at Selden Hall University. Thank you so much, Dr. Worthy, for joining us today. Um, really excited about this workshop. I see there's a lot of folks in the room, so really excited to turn it over to you now. Well, thank you for having me. So what I'll do now is share my screen with everyone. Give me a second here. Right. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Oh, perfect. All right, thank you for having me and thank you all for showing up and taking some time out for yourself today and you know combating this thing that we all have dealt with at some point, which is imposter syndrome. All right. So today what we'll get into is addressing these three different questions, right? What is it? Who is at risk and how to combat it? And so I encourage you guys to try to follow along with me. I want to sort of breeze through it as far as what is it and who is at risk and then really focus on how to combat it because I think you know that's a part of the reason why you're all here is like we sort of have an idea of, of what it is maybe you need to know more about what makes you vulnerable to imposter syndrome but I also want to spend a bulk of the time with talking about ways to challenge it and then um, open it up to any questions okay all right so here are some common phrases, themes of what people say who often experience uh, imposter syndrome. And so I always share credit with others, even if I did most of the work. And so if you can sort of read these different phrases here, what the theme that I see is that they're minim minimizing efforts and performance and feeling the need to give others credit because of poor self-confidence, right? And so these are things that um, many of us may have told ourselves, may have said to other people, and the goal for the first section here about what is it is to normalize imposter syndrome. And I think that's one way we can combat it is if we start to normalize it and, and notice that even myself I'm presenting today, there is some imposterism that, that comes up, right? Like, am I competent enough, right? And so I challenge it by normalizing it with myself. And I'm like, it's over 80 people here, it's over 90 people. So you guys are with me with combating imposter syndrome. All right, so Clarence and I were the first people to sort of coin the term imposter syndrome. 
And so essentially what it is, is this fear of being found out if you don't work harder or longer than everyone else, okay? Some people believe others are more qualified than you are. And every time you succeed, you're not confident you can do it again, okay? This normally occurs when there is a tension between two views, yours and what you believe what others expect of you. And so as you can see here, um, as far as their definition, it's like you're lucky. You're lucky to have been at Columbia. You're lucky to be in this program. It's not based on your ability. And so again, there's this theme of minimizing, right? Which we'll talk later about as far as one of these cognitive distortions, these irrational beliefs that we aren't enough. We don't belong here, okay? And so this tension between the standards you set for yourself and how you, you assess yourself as doing. So even furthermore, Dr. Valerie Young categorized uh, imposter syndrome into these five different groups here. We have the perfectionist, the natural genius, the soloist, the expert, and the super person. And as we transition to these next few slides, you'll get an opportunity to see the type of shows that I'm interested in based on these characters that sort of speaks to me when I think of these different competence types, okay? So the first one is the perfectionist, right? So the perfectionist here, the main focus is on setting high, very much unrealistic goals for themselves, right? And they, value, they, de they define their competence based on performance 100% of the time. So if it's not perfect, they don't see themselves as competent. And so what this can lead to is self-doubt and worry. Some great examples of if this applies to you, right? Um, perfectionist often micromanages in groups has difficulty delegating, giving other people an option, they may procrastinate because it's not good enough because it's not perfect, okay? This person may obsess over getting things wrong, right? I don't want to uh, submit yet because it's not quite right, so I need to get all the information I can, okay? And instead of celebrating what they did well, they focus on what they could have done better. And so a great example, I remember uh, when I worked in a college counseling center, and I had a client who was you know, a biology major and she said, hey, I got this 94 on the exam. I gotta figure out what's going on. Why didn't I get this 100? And so she really obsessed over all of the, the maybe two or three questions that she got incorrect over this exam, okay? And so you see natural genius, Jimmy Neutron here. So this natural genius really focuses on how quickly or easily they can complete a task. So they're defining their competence as based on how quick I can get it done and is it right the first time, okay? So some examples of the natural genius to sort of see if you, you fall into this category is that they wanna give up if they didn't get it right the first time. So after that first attempt, if, it, if they don't get it, if they don't do it with ease, if they don't perform well the first time, they're saying, you know what, I give up. Of course, this leads to more self-doubt, self-worry, and what I see here is that instead of focusing on the process, right, instead of focusing on, you know, the time spent studying, the time spent in groups, they measure their competence based on getting it right the first try, okay? And I do apologize, you know, we live in the city, so there's always some noise. So some noise in the background, I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> All right, and then we have the soloist. So the soloist, I don't know if people are familiar with how to get away with murder, one of my favorite shows, we have Michaela Pratt here. So this person focuses on completing tasks independently. So this is the type of person that does not ask for help. They define their competence based on, can I do it myself, right? As you can imagine, this creates more stress, more frustration. This person is not gonna ask for help even if they need it. This can lead to burnout, like all of these different examples that I provided. And then you have the expert. So the expert focuses on what and how much they know or can do. So this person is the type of person if, like for example, um, I'll use myself as an example. So even though I'm presenting for today, I'm like, let me do some more research. Even though I've, I've had several talks on imposterism and imposter syndrome, I've talked to experts on my podcast with imposter syndrome, I'm re reading or listening again to the podcast. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to add this thing in. Even before today, or even before minutes before, I'm like, oh, let me add this one thing for an example, right? So the expert is constantly trying to, you know, gain more certifications, get more learning. They don't feel quite adequate, quite up to par with what they need, okay? As you can see, this creates more stress, more anxiety, more self-doubt, more worry, 
right? Which it leads to anxiety and depression, which we'll talk later about. The super person. I don't know if people are familiar with Parks and Rec. We all know Leslie Nope. She likes to do many different things, right? So she, this is the type of person who defines their competence based on how many roles they can fulfill, right? So they're not only a student, they're volunteering, they're, you know, helping out with family, they're trying to fulfill roles there, you know, they are overextending themselves. This person is, doesn't quite feel competent enough if they're not working late, right? If they're not going the extra mile. This person, for example, may be in a group and decide, you know what, I'll do your part and I'll do your part as well, right? Because they're defining their competence, you know, uh, based on how many roles they can do and if they're successful. Again, sorry, again, leading to burnout. So who does it impact? Almost everyone, okay? And especially those are in marginalized groups. Okay, so people who are in marginalized groups are more vulnerable, more susceptible. And the first group I will talk about is the BIPOC, which is Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color. All right, and so some of the causes of imposter syndrome, primary one, which we all can sort of relate to, which is underrepresentation, right? When we don't see ourselves, it's hard for us to feel confident in our abilities. We don't see ourselves, we don't have anyone to go to when we experience a microaggression, or we don't feel confident, or we feel like we need extra help, right? So think about, you know, the competence type that doesn't like to ask for help, that soloist. If they're in an environment where they don't see people who look like them, who have shared identities, that's going to really perpetuate that role of feeling like they need to be independent, okay? And then we have the familial and parenting dynamics. Here, so this is sort of how our families can contribute to us developing imposterism. And I know I'm speaking based on this BIPOC community, but this can apply to all people, right? Where in some families, our families may, you know, encourage us or have this expectation for us to be more sensitive or more social. They want us to be more social in the family, more of a caretaker. So a person who comes from that type of family of course, they're going to question whether or not they're competent enough because their family has sort of groomed them of fitting into this role as a caretaker, as more sensitive, as more nurturing. On the other extreme, there are some families where um, I'm going to use the term conditional positive regard, which was popularized by Carl Rogers, where the, the praise is indiscriminate, right? You only get praise if you um, meet their condition, which is all A's, right? If you have a B, we shame the B and you only get praise when there's all A's or when you're doing something that shows that you're smart and you're competent, okay? And then we have generational and socioeconomic status. And this speaks for people who, especially low income people, I think about it, or just gener coming from a generation, maybe you're the first, first gen college student, right? Sometimes people who come from those environments feel like they have to really carry the family on their back and they have to be the person of, uh, provide for the family financially, emotionally. So it is a lot of pressure for someone who comes from these low income environments where they're first in a college student, okay? And these different traits, as I mentioned, whether it be these different competence types, the feeling of being lucky, not feeling good enough, not feeling competent enough, this can lead to anxiety, depression. It can lead to self-deprecating thoughts having negative thoughts about yourself, shaming yourself. And we'll talk more about some of the other um, things that can happen. All right. And so I also wanna shine light to black graduate students, okay? And I think this is helpful. One of the questions that I've seen um, from some of the questions that the students uh, asked was addressing microaggressions. Right. And so this is why I think it's important for all of us to be aware of everyone's experience, not just in school, but at work, in your community, et cetera. OK, so for black graduate students, the meaning of graduate school itself is, is different. Right. So, again, you're sort of carrying the weight of the family. Not only are you carrying the weight of the family, oftentimes, and I've myself experienced this, where I, I felt like I I was asked a question and I was speaking on behalf of all black graduate students or all black lesbians, right? And so that can create a lot of, an immense amount of pressure, right? Additionally, 
graduate school, graduate school for black students could mean that they're honoring their ancestors, right? They're breaking down barriers and increasing pathways for future generations. They're uplifting their families and their communities and eventually increase the number um, of just the black experience, the black faculty, uh, et cetera, okay? Additionally, you know, black graduate students must overcome racially hostile campuses, marginalization and racism from peers and faculty, okay? And so because of racial minority, they feel hyper visible, right? So the example that I gave, I went to a P I first went to a HBCU, which was Winston-Salem State University. And then afterwards I went to Seton Hall University. So it was went to primarily seeing people who look like me and being sort of catapulted into this new world, right? Where I was hyper visible. I felt like, and I also experienced there wasn't a feeling like people were pulling for me to speak, but pulling for me to speak for maybe the wrong reasons, right? For my black experience. Okay. And so that made me feel hyper visible. And at the same time, I felt invisible because there was no one I could relate to, right? Um, and one, sorry, in one uh, article that I read, um, one of the, the graduate students said that being at a PWI was a psychologically toxic environment, right? So this means that is, you know, again, that trying to balance being hyper visible and invisible can create a lot of stress internally and externally, trying to figure out how do I show up for this class while being me and also feeling not having the pressure to speak on all of Black students, okay? Additionally, uh, we can also experience the pedestal effect, right? And the pedestal effect, I don't know if people are familiar with this term. And this could, again, for all of us, right, depending on our environment, but especially for black graduate students, the pedestal effect just sort of is a symbol of where our families have put us, right? We put this on this pedestal and we have to try to fulfill this role, right? To fulfill this role that has been given to us without us even asking for it. Right, again, creating a lot of pressure where families sort of romanticize the status. Okay, I have a, for example, I remember working with a client who was a black graduate student and she said, I'm, I'm really worried because I'm about to graduate and my, parent, my family, my friends are expecting me to graduate and make a lot of money, right? There's this pressure that she felt that she had to provide for the family to sort of keep up with this idea that they had of her. Okay. And of course, like all of this imposterism can lead to psychosocial costs, right? So working hard not to prevent discovery, but to defy negative stereotypes about their intelligence and to prove their intellectual belonging to others and possibly themselves. Okay. Um, again, leading to racial isolation and feelings of otherness. All right. Finally, we want to talk about women in the LGBTQ community. Okay, so these are these vulnerable populations. So we started with BIPOC, broke, broke, broke it down even further to Black graduate students, and now to women in the LGBTQ community. Okay, so let's look at some of these contributing factors here. So we have social, cultural, and personal. So social cultural is this pervasive racism that is, you know, inherently in environment, um, inherently in other people. And then we have gender stereotypes of, you know, we've all sort of heard societal expectations of women, you know, before not being as strong in math as men. And so that sort of sticks with us, right? We start to second guess ourselves. Am I, should I belong here? You know, sometimes, and I, I know from my experience in, in working at Columbia, especially different pro, um, graduate programs or even majors, they are predominantly men and predominantly white men, right? And so that can make someone feel not adequate, not good enough. And so the reason why I'm sharing that is because I want to validate that feeling because it's there for a reason, because it's not something that um, you experience or that's completely inherent. Society also perpetuates some of these gender stereotypes, okay? And lastly, homophobia, right? Or transphobia, right? I've, I've had patients who, who identify as trans and worry what it would look like for them to actually get a job. Do I have to disclose? Do I have to share, you know, my birth before I transition, my gender at birth before I transition, or sex at birth, right? And so these are things that unfortunately women, the LGBTQ community, Black people, BIPOC community, they are, we're thinking about all of these different things simultaneously while also trying to be a student. 
right, while also trying to be an intern or a volunteer or a leader of an organization or club. Again, social cultural contributing factors, lack of representation, right? So again, if you don't see people who look like you, who have shared identities, and who are also talking about a shared experience, it's gonna be unlikely, it's gonna be unlikely for you to feel confident in yourself and even reach out for help. The other thing I want to, to just uh, note here is just the personal, the, the internalized racism, the homophobia, or just being a woman and not feeling adequate enough, right? Maybe there was some messages that you received from family, from your friends, from peers, colleagues that made you feel undeserving, okay? Feeling like a fraud. And the other thing I wanna mention here are the personality characteristics. And specifically what I'm, I'm interested in is just these um, mental health concerns, right? So if you're already someone who has a history of anxiety, a history of depression, or just history of having poor self-confidence, chances are you are gonna be vulnerable to you know, experiencing imposterism because you're also not feeling confident in yourself. So as we transition here to some strategies to combat imposterism, I say don't let it happen. And I know that's not easy for all of us, right? As I share with you, I started off maybe with some imposterism today, okay? So one strategy is to open up, right? Open up to spaces, to people that feel safe, right? Meaning that they validate your, your experience, that they, they wanna listen, that they wanna understand. And they also with you want to either advocate for you or give you some strategies to help you with overcoming imposterism, okay? And B, be aware that your inner critic can be your worst enemy. So our brains are sort of like the channel six news, right? Our, and this is a lot of research to support this. Our, our brain sort of, um, what comes, comes to our awareness of all the things that we're not good at, right? All the things that are negative, right? All of the, the that aggression or just the, our insecurities sort of play up more than the things that we're strong in, right? I remember, you know, asking people, what are your strengths? That usually takes you some time to think about, right? Especially people who experience imposterism, right? So what usually comes up is their flaws, right? And so your, your, your brain, your internal experience can be your worst critic. And so with that, we want to challenge cognitive distortions. And cognitive distortions are irrational thoughts that increase our anxiety, increase our self-doubt and worry. And ultimately, it doesn't make us feel good about ourselves or about our experience, right? And so we wanna challenge it with positive thinking, okay? And then, and most importantly, we wanna make space for all emotions. As I mentioned, imposterism is something that almost all of us experience. Right. And so we want to we want to see it as anxiety. We want to see it as joy. We want to see it as happy. We want to see it as contentment. We want to see it as, you know, embarrassment. We want to make space for all of those things, because when we lean heavily on a negative emotion, we're giving that emotion all of our attention. One of my friends and I had a conversation and one thing he um, described to me about making space for his emotions is that he he said he imagines being at a dinner table, right? And all of his emotions are around. He's the host, his emotions are the guests. And instead of focusing on that imposterism or that negative belief, he also tries to give attention to all of those emotions, right? Maybe there's some excitement, some joy about being at Columbia or being in your program. Maybe you have an upcoming date that you're really excited about, right? Or maybe you're just feeling contentment about your family. Okay, so we wanna make space of all of those and even more so, we don't want to label our emotions. Emotions are not good or bad, they're an emotion, right? So oftentimes it's coming from somewhere, but we don't have to label them and then sort of um, perpetuate it. If you feel that you're not good enough, right? You sort of lean heavily on that emotion, chances are you're gonna feel like crap, right? You're gonna experience a low mood, you're gonna feel anxious, and behaviorally is gonna impact how much you engage in class. So a great example, again, I'll use myself, is when I remember being in grad school, again, being at a PWI, and I just didn't feel confident because most of my classes, I was the only black person in the class, right? And even more so, I was the only lesbian in the class. And so most of the questions about any black experiences or lesbian or any queer experiences 
or directed towards me. And because of my anxiety, because of my imposterism, I felt, felt quiet most of class, right? I was silent. And still to this day, it's something that I regret, even though I can say I know why it was there. But that's, the, that's how it can impact us behaviorally. So having a negative thought, which we'll talk about, having poor self-perception, not feeling confident in yourself, who you are, can lead to these cognitive distortions. I'm not good enough. Who cares that I got into the school, right? I still have so much more to prove. The negative emotions, feeling shame, feeling doubt, feeling worry. Just again, not feeling good enough, feeling like, again, that this is just luck. They only chose me because I am a woman, a black queer woman, right? Not because of my competence, right? And then again, going to these, it can lead to these avoidant or controlling behaviors such as maybe I'm not showing up to class, right? Or maybe I'm just gonna be really silent and not participate, or I'm gonna be over controlling, right? I'm gonna bust my butt and I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna stay late. You know, I'm gonna experience burnout, right? And as you can see here, there's a relationship. So all of these things influence the other, right? And so the more that you engage into these avoided or controlling behaviors, the more it decreases your self-perception. Right, because you you continuously feel inadequate. Okay, so I I want to just give some um, just give some light to cognitive distortion. Okay, and so I don't know how many of you have participated therapy, and so cognitive distortions come from an, a, a theoretical approach and intervention called cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And so essentially what CBT says is that our thoughts influence our behaviors, influence our feelings, and it's sort of, again, the cycle that I gave. If you have a negative thought, then chances are you're gonna not feel so good about yourself and it's gonna impact your behavior, right? And so one way to um, combat these cognitive distortions, especially as it pertains to imposterism, is first identifying it as irrational. Right. I won't go through all of them, but if it's helpful for if people have questions about any of them, that's totally fine. Um, but some of the common ones that, you know, we all experience at some point, they're all or nothing thinking. So very black and white. If I don't get it right the first time, then it's not good enough. Right. So it's just very extreme. There's no there's no balance. There's no gray area. Right. And even overgeneralizing, you see a single negative event. Um, and you just sort of, okay, this is how it is for me. This is always going to be this way for me. If you get rejected for a date, I'm not trying again. Or if you don't get that, that scholarship you wanted, if you don't get entry into that, um, the class, I'm never trying this again. And then, and then you sort of, it's sort of like a confirmation bias. See, I knew I wasn't good enough, right? Um, and then we have just like these irrational reasoning, right? Which could be, excuse me. <clears throat> So we have a rational reasoning. And so here you're trying to make sense of uh, what is happening, right? Like I knew I didn't do good enough because maybe I didn't study enough or I'm just not smart enough, okay? And then another one that I often hear is the should statements. I should have done better. I should have gotten here. I should have done this. The reason why should is irrational is because it, it adds this added pressure that you always have to be perfect, right? It doesn't allow space for you to learn right? All, none of us are perfect, right? And that's the first thing I, I express to, you know, my clients, especially those who are um, perfectionists, right? None of us are perfect, right? And the first step is just accepting that. And that's okay, right? That we are, we still have so much to learn and we can have people to support us in learning. Um, I do want to throw it out before I continue here and ask people, if they have any questions about this slide, if there's anything that they can identify with, or if they want to give any examples to maybe how they've experienced all or nothing thinking, jumping to conclusions, et cetera. Okay, so I'll continue, all right. Oh, do you have a question? I can't really see people putting their hands up. Okay, so one way to tackle these cognitive distortions is, again, using the CBT model here, which I think is really helpful, 
um, is identify or asking yourself, what is the evidence that this thought is true about me? So writing that down, right? So this can take some work to overcome imposterism. What is the evidence that I'm not good enough? What is the evidence that I'm dumb, that I'm incompetent? So you write all of that down. And then in another column, excuse me, you write, what is the evidence that this is false, right? So this is anything that sort of, you know, does not support this belief that it is true, okay? And so you sort of weigh the pros and cons. And I like to encourage people to pretend that you are the judge, you know, and both lawyers on opposing sides, right? Where you're trying to argue what is true and argue what is false, okay? And eventually the, the goal is to create some type of balance because I often hear people say, well, Dr. Worthy, what if this is true? What if I'm not as good in this, right? And I'm, okay, that may be true. Let's look at the evidence, but also let's focus on what you can do to improve. Because again, we all aren't perfect and it's okay to not be good at something and just to identify it as that. And we can also work on it, improving it, okay? And the last thing I encourage is with these kinds of distortions. So you saying the evidence, what's the evidence true? What is the opposing evidence here? Focusing on your strengths. So this is something that I often encourage my athletes to do. And so in order to build your confidence, we first have to reflect on our past successes. And so for you guys, I encourage looking at their resume. I don't know how many times you probably have tweaked your resume, tweaked your CV, and you wrote about yourself, and you wrote about all of your accomplishments, right? That's one place to start. Looking at that resume and say, you know what? I do deserve to be here, right? And then also thinking about other strengths you may have. Again, we don't wanna focus primarily on the negative emotions, right? Because that just, you know, you're putting uh, more information into that confirmation bias that you're not good enough. We wanna be balanced. And we also wanna be people that are learning, right? There are gonna be things that we're not so good at and that's okay. And there are things that we can do to improve it. Some other reframing tips is to explore what is stressing you, right? Looking at it from a fresh perspective, maybe confiding or consulting with a friend, a colleague, a mentor to say, hey, what do you think about this? I'm having this experience. I'm not feeling adequate enough. What do you think, right? And then find what you can change. As I shared before, if, if it is something that you're struggling with, is it possible? Can you change it, right? Um, and that's okay, right? With positive re reframing, you may see possibilities you weren't even aware of, right? Maybe reaching out to someone, maybe reaching out to a mentor that has a shared experience and that can uplift and pour into you and say, you know what, it's gonna be okay. This is how I navigated through these hurdles. Okay. And then identifying the benefits. Find the benefits in the situation you face, right? So for example, I remember being in grad school and a part of you know, my uh, grad school experience was each year we have to apply to a different externship. So five-year program each year after applying, you're competing with people in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Connecticut. So it was high stakes every time, right? And I would get really upset and second guess and question my ability and competence if I didn't get that, that position that I wanted, right? And so what I try to do as a reframe is I say to myself, well, I'll be where I'm supposed to be, right? And I think about where I'm at, like the, the externship opportunities that I receive, and I try to make the best of that experience and setting goals for myself. Like, here's what I can learn here, right? Maybe I didn't get that other opportunity, but what can I do to expand my learning, to expand my perspective, to make me feel whole and complete, okay? And then discover the humor. There is ther therapy in humor, okay? There's actually spaces for people to just go and laugh. I don't know if you guys ever seen the TED talk of utilizing humor for therapy, but people actually go to places like as a, think of a yoga studio and is you laugh the entire time. Like that is the prompt, you laugh, right? And there is, there is humor, there's, as I said, there's therapy and humor, but we can often, sometimes I'm like, why would I think that silly thing? That's so silly of me to think, right? Or sharing it with someone else and you finding the humor can make it, it's sort of you're releasing that tension. It can be a cathartic experience, okay? And then before we jump to any questions, some of my concluding remarks are, 
imposter syndrome is a feeling that, again, most of us can identify with. So again, we're normalizing this thing. I'm sure if I could see everyone and I asked everyone to raise their hand, if, at some point in time, have you experienced this thing, imposterism? Yes, right? And it sort of ebbs and flows. There are times in which we can feel really confident, and there are times in which we may not feel as confident. And at those points, I want you to ask yourself, what is different about this situation? Are you in a transition, right? Maybe there's things going on in the background that has nothing to do with school that's causing you to question your confidence, question your competence, question your ability, okay? And again, it can have a particular impact on marginalized populations. And so again, we're normalizing this thing where I'm putting it out there to all of you, right? And so we want to be even more aware of people who are part of marginalized populations so that we don't sort of pour in that negative energy that can perpetuate that they aren't good enough, right? Maybe offering a space for them, okay? And again, you know, we've all experienced a pandemic, right? And we are, we experienced a pandemic effect in which we actually saw a lot of, a, a lot of losses, right? Where our future is unpredictable. And so this sort of, again, perpetuates us not feeling as certain about our future, right? And so we want to normalize and also validate that, that this is a thing, right? I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of clients that I work with and even myself just really struggling with this fatigue, this motivation, low energy, and imagining, imagine feeling that and you also having to show up for other people to show up in class and to sort of be confident when you're not feeling so well yourself, okay? And lastly, you know, the strategy that I sort of apply and encourage other people to apply, and it, it will take some work, right? Challenging those negative thoughts by opening up to others, not just to anyone, right? People that you feel safe with, these people will ask questions to learn more about your experience. They will validate you. You know, they won't just sort of shrug it off or switch the topic. They're gonna be genuinely interested and want to support you, okay? And just improving your awareness, right? Being aware of, all of your feelings, not just the negative ones, and being curious, right? I wonder what's happening today that I don't feel confident. I wonder what's happening today that I feel like an imposter, right? What's happening today is I was brought here to talk about imposterism, right? So I am, I am, the spotlight is on me, right? So that makes sense to why I can, you know, have some anxiety or some nervousness, right? But I don't have to sit in that. I know where it's coming from, and I can sort of move through it without labeling myself based on that emotion, okay? And then challenging negative thoughts, right? As I mentioned, we have these cognitive distortions that come up and we all experience them. No one is immune to, to negative thoughts, okay? We all experience them at some point and we want to nip them in the bud. The more they linger, they, they hang out in the background, right? They, they ling linger in your subconscious and unconscious. And the more we sort of let them stay there and we're not address them, this sort of, again, feels the, the, um, the meaning for you not being good enough, okay? And then we wanna focus on our strengths, not just focus on the things we're not good at. Look at that resume, talk to people who know you, talk to a mentor, talk to a professor, check in and say, how am I doing, right? I've had people, have, I've, had, I've heard people ask their mentors, their advisors, you know, their professors, do you think I belong here, right? Sometimes we have to do a reality check. And that's okay, right? And what are the reasons why you think I belong here, right? And sometimes we need that reassurance and it's okay, you're human. We all need reassurance. We are social beings and we've thrived based on that, supporting one another, again. And lastly, making space for all emotions as I share. So we're gonna make space for all emotions, not the negative ones. Remember Dr. Worthy said that we all experience emotion, right? We can just sort of see them, okay, that sadness is coming up, right? Or that despair is coming up. I wonder why, right? It doesn't mean anything different about me from two minutes ago that this came up. I'm still the same person in this moment, right? But what's happening in my life that's bringing this on and being curious about it and trying to tackle it in the moment, okay? All right, so we have some time here and I wanna just throw it over to you guys. I think I sort of stopped where I want it. Are there any questions for today? Okay. We relate to all the imposter syndrome archetypes. 
Okay, let me see here. I can move this. What was the question again? I'm trying to see the the question in there. Okay. Of the imposter syndrome archetypes. I think it was no, early on in the presentation. Oh, okay. Um, no, my advice does not change, right? And my advice there would be to maybe find a space where you can sort of unpack and process why you're you're fitting into all of these competence types, right? Because there's something there that may be unresolved and that's where therapy can come in. And I think challenging and being, you know, these things come up for us for a reason, whether it be family, whether as I, I share with you, social pressures, um, peer pressure, you know, just being in a, in a class where you just don't feel like you belong. And I think, of course, challenging those thoughts, going up to other people, my advice is still the same. And if you're, again, if you're fitting into all of those competence types, I encourage seeking some, some help from an expert to help you understand where the root of it is coming from. Thank you for sharing. Uh, my name is Cynthia. This is so relatable, even like in medical school. And it was nice hearing you um, describe it because I, I didn't even realize that was what was going on um, mm -hmm. when I went through medical school. But to know that there's like a definition for it or like this, um, I think getting a sense that you were not alone. Um, there are mm -hmm. other people that have experienced this and and thanks for sharing in terms of not just talking about a topic, but ways to also um, address it or things that you can do to improve um, those sort of feelings. So thank you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you for joining. Noelle, I see you have your hand up. Thanks for taking my question. So I, I came on late and I just, the two things I wanted to ask, um, is if you if you are going to share your slides because I heard someone mention about imposter syndrome archetypes, I'll be interested mm -hmm. to find out about that. But I guess even though I came in late, I just want to ask my question outright that I probably would have asked anyway. Um, uh, is does it ever stop? Like I'm seeing it <laughs> everywhere in business, at school, everywhere. I mean, in certain relationships, there was a situation that I didn't feel comfortable relating to in an investor conversation and I couldn't I couldn't share that I the, the level of discomfort I felt like I should know mm -hmm. how to be an investor or know the conversation of investors or be able to you know like these biz these conversations that we never have you know what I mean at, at my we didn't have at my kitchen table at least so mm -hmm. I'm just saying does that experience of yourself of not belonging ever actually stop or is it something that you just sort of like bring radical acceptance to like it's already always there and mm -hmm. notice it and it's just a matter of like shutting that voice off or finding that pause button for it I know that's so, a loaded question you probably no no no. Your thing. no 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 I All think right. it's a, a a great question right uh the question was does it ever go away? Does it stay, right? So that was basically basically what Noel asked. And my answer to that is, Noel, sometimes you, I get, you mentioned a voice, right? I think sometimes the voice is a little quieter, right? But a part of that, I see it as a, as a function of, and this is my reframe, and this is something I sort of do for myself. I see that voice as a way to motivate me, to keep me going, but I also have to be mindful of boundary setting for myself, not working too hard, like not overworking, right? The same thing with people can okay. overexercise, right? right? And so the, that voice sometimes gets louder and sometimes it gets louder for a reason, right? There could be something happening with the dynamic that makes you feel inferior, right? Um, sometimes there's something that's happening in the space that makes you feel like you're not good enough. Maybe someone's expecting something of you. Maybe the feedback makes you sort of ouch, that hurt. This makes me feel like I don't belong, right? Yeah. So my answer, my answer to that is it comes and goes just like any other emotion, right? And I think it's those negative emotions that we all try to 
sort of pushed down and we don't want to feel. But when it's a positive emotion like excitement, happy, and joy, we want it all the time, right? But negative right. emotions is what makes us human, all of it. Like we are capable to experience all emotions. And so I say that because we want to just see it. Okay, it's coming up. I wonder why. Maybe I'm in this relationship and she, she or they are giving me this feedback that I'm not good enough. And so yeah. that would make sense, right? So you're validating yourself. You're being curious of why it's happening. And can you do something about it? Yeah, thanks for saying that. You brought mm -hmm. up something else that just made me think because it's, I'm noticing it in another, I'm in a school of social work. And just as I, you know, trying to understand theoretical models, I'm discovering that I'm sort of trapped in only understanding it through the lens of not belonging. Mm. It's a very interesting perspective to have to give up, you know what I mean? Like to try to understand things like biosocial theory, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, and getting that me being black may not have anything to do with that, or it could, you know, but it was just, so it's just shifting. So, but I'm glad you used the word validating because that's exactly what I have been doing about mm -hmm. it. Like noticing yeah. it, validating it, sharing it. And that is somehow giving me access to move beyond it. But I'm just like, does this, am I, is that going to be the practice? But it may be the way I get to Carnegie Hall on this. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, giving it up, yeah, giving it, that's, it that's it up, the practice, it up, knowing it that it's going to yeah. come and go. Yeah. Right? And I have, a, I have a question here. Thank uh, you. And I'll, no problem, no problem, Noel. Thanks for participating. So I identify as a cis white male and I experience all of these cognitive distortions, but I'm not considered a marginalized group. Does this still hold true for me? Yes. Um, is it possible that I'm trying to perform avoided or controlling behaviors to combat the distortions because I'm trying to compensate for the negative lens on cis white males? I think it's possible, but I, as I mentioned before, all of us, no one is immune to imposterism. And oftentimes it comes from like, whether it be inherent, like from early on, right? It sort of brings me back to attachment style, right? We sort of are those early caretakers, that home environment, that nuclear family influence these behaviors that we develop because we're learning from them, right? Whether depending on the type of role you are in or being a cis white male and we're talking about these vulnerable populations or being a cis white male um, in a, you know, there's some majors or, um, programs that are predominantly women, right? And so we want to validate that, that, that experience. And so you can be a minority in that classroom, right? Um, but I do want to just sort of answer the question. This holds true for everyone, right? And again, if it's coming up for you, think about what's happening in that moment. What is causing this, right? Instead of just saying, I'm not good enough, be curious about the feeling. Why do I feel not good enough in this experience? Is it because that the speaker is black and she's, you know, outlining these marginalized groups? Or is it because, you know, there is some, there's some awareness of white privilege, right? And I'm trying to combat that. And that's just my example for that question. Okay. And I see Pilar has her hand up. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, yeah, you did. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, well, thank you so much for your presentation today. It's very helpful. I'm also from the School of Social Work, I'm Noelle's classmate. Um, so my question is, it's what I feel for me, it's one thing to understand this, um, you know, imposter syndrome. And it's another thing to kind of manage the imposter syndrome when you're in a group with other people, especially when you're talking. I find I frequently, I think it was one of your first slides, I frequently, when I'm talking to some people, um, minimize my impact, minimize my accomplishments, or I might kind of dismiss things quickly if I get praised, or I might, you know, consider myself, oh, it's lucky that I got into Columbia, or whatever it is. But, you know, when you're on the fly and with people, do you have any tips or things to, yeah, just like tips that we can be aware of? Because I know for a fact I do this when I'm talking, but I just feel like dialogue is so fast paced and these, mm -hmm. these things are happening. You know, it doesn't give us time to like go away, think about it. But I can do that work now, but when I'm in the moment, it's, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, should I just be quiet? 
Because <laughs> yeah, my, it seems like my default sometimes is to go to these kind of comments and it's not good. I'm, I'm the one putting myself down. Other people are not. So mm -hmm. it's an observation. And I, yeah, I just want to know if you had any tips or what your thoughts would be. Thank you. No, yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And so what I would say, and I'm going to use the analogy of exercise, right? Or even, I don't know if you guys ever participated in a sport or did anything sort of active or something, you had to learn something new. Right. And so it's not going to work unless you practice it. Right. Unless you do some self work. And so in my own experience with dealing and combating imposterism, again, it, it still comes up, but we have to, whether it be journal, we have to do some self reflection. Right. And again, thinking about why is it coming up? And one thing that I did when I, I think I shared with you where I was quiet in class because I didn't feel confident and I felt like I didn't belong is I would set these goals for myself right? I'm going to speak this amount of times, right? This is what I'm going to contribute to class, right? And so often a lot of the work takes place outside of the conversation, right? So you owe it to yourself to sit down with yourself, whether with yourself, a colleague, a partner, or with a therapist to unpack why this is coming up for you and setting those realistic goals for yourself. Like, how can I just be me? Why am I you know, more reserved in this conversation as opposed to talking to Noel, for example, and I'm only using him to teach his participator, right? I may be more calm with him as opposed to talking to these people. I wonder why that is, right? Checking in with yourselves. The, both of the people that just spoke are both social workers, right? So I, and we all are human, right? And so there's this level of, whether it be intuition, emotional attunement that we are picking up from people that we're around that can make us feel less than, right? And so you wanna be aware of that. All of it is not just you. And so that's one thing I'm normalizing, even for the, the example of the, you know, the question about the cis white male. It's not all about you, right? Some of the stuff you're picking up from your environment that can cause you to feel a certain way. Okay, so we wanna give credit to that as well. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. And I see Asana, and please, I, I don't want so I know people struggle with pronouncing my name, which is Kiasha. And so I want to make sure I, you know, I'm very careful with other people's names. So Asana, you want to chime in? Dr. Worthy, yes, this is Asana. Um, so just to kind of like reiterate, re reiterate and, you know, validate what Pilar was saying, um, just before this presentation, I was speaking to my daughter about an, an interaction that she had over the phone. And I, it, it, I became really activated even after the conversation was done. I kept returning to it. And what was coming up for me was an, uh, an incident that I had yesterday, which I find that I, I don't tell people, one, that I go to Columbia, and two, that I'm studying social work, because there's this um, expectation or there's a way that um, folks try to engage with me that it is not helpful at that time. So if I'm going, for example, to get, you know, mental health services, I definitely don't share it because I want to just have that, that person speak to me naturally as they would um, with their clients using language that, that would be appropriate for their clients, not to minimize it or, or to, to, to um, make me seem like I'm, I'm not educated, but I realize that there's an expectation that if I say I'm a student at Columbia and I'm, a, and I'm studying social work, that folks are, le are, are less inclined to help me when I'm asking for help. Mm -hmm. And what, that, what happens is then I don't want to ask for help because literally oh. they will say, oh, well, you, you seem very articulate. Oh, well, you went to Columbia. I wish I could have gone there and they don't want to help me when I'm asking for help. So now I don't want to ask for any help because no one's going to help me because they think I can take care of it by myself. You're smart enough, you're articulate, you got this type of thing. So it's like, you know what? So now I'm just going to have to struggle on my own. I'm going to have to mess this thing up that I really shouldn't have to because one thing is identifying that you have a problem and that you need help and reaching out. And you know, the expectation is that someone will offer something that is helpful mm -hmm. in some way. So that, that it just really rang out to me when we talked about kind of like minimizing our success or our, our expectations and also recognizing our identity where folks aren't meeting us you know, where we are. Yeah, and I wanna just stretch you a little bit and challenge your thinking. So that was a, a kind of distortion that no one will help me, every, you know, and so there are people like me and like other people, regardless of race or gender, that will help you, 
right? And so that, again, that perpetuates that imposterism or perpetuates that soloist, that competence type that I have to do it by myself. And so sometimes it can take more work to get the help you need or, or more work to feel confident and or whatever it may be. And so I encourage you to, to not give up on yourself, right? And encourage you to sort of combat that experience because there's a reason why you feel that way, but it's not true all the time. Right, so it could that's that overgeneralizing that black and or I would say overgeneralizing. Okay. Uh, Yvette. Yes. Um, oh, I can't can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. Um, so I identify as Latina, and recently a friend of mine was sharing she she attended a. Um, I guess something similar to this where someone was sharing that Latinos tend to, um, I guess, be overly thankful to be in a position, right? Like there's this sense of like, oh my gosh, thank you so much that I'm here, et cetera. Um, and I have been struggling with finding a balance between that, right? Because I think it holds true for me, right? Like I think, and maybe some of it has to do with the intersection of my faith my background, et cetera, but like finding that balance between like, hey, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Like I realize that yes, they, I put in work, but there's also an element of like, there's plenty of people who work hard and don't get to a certain place, right? Um, but then also maybe overdoing it, right? And so I guess my question with that frame is kind of like, how do you, what is a good way of identifying when am I over leaning on that? And perhaps it's more imposter syndrome than gratefulness. Mm -hmm. And like, how, I guess, how do you find that balance? Okay. And so I would say to think about when it comes up, when are you more likely to be appreciative? Is it when you're at Columbia, when you're speaking to, if there's a power dynamic, if there's like a professor in you or, you know, an internship supervisor in you, um, to be, curious about that because as you said it's not happening all the time and so think about when it's coming up mostly for you okay um one thing i wanted to and i, I don't think i touched on um enough was the, the cultural influences that can come up for all of us and sort of again contributing to this imposterism and so just to answer all of the questions and especially the last one is just to, to take a step back again the work is done outside of the classroom outside of the conversations, the dialogue that you're having, outside of having conversations with your child, right? It, it's done personally, like whether you're sitting down with yourself. And I always use the word curious, right? Be curious, ask yourself, stretch yourself and say, why is this coming up for me right now, right? I too minimize my accomplishments when I go back home. I don't talk about anything that I'm doing. And why is that, right? Because I don't, I know for myself, I don't want people to feel that I'm better than them, right? And I know I'm not, but I can also be confident and proud, right? So how much of that is humility versus the other thing, right? And so that's my work that I sort of do. And again, I set these realistic goals for myself and maybe a part of it is because I was a, an athlete and sort of I, I work better if I have something I'm working towards, right? And so I set the goal. When I go home, you know what? I'm gonna be me, I'm gonna speak the way I speak. You know, I can code switch, we all do, but I'm gonna be me. If someone asks me about what I'm doing, I'm gonna share. Because if the person really likes you, if the student is, I mean, the, the professor, you know, your classmates are telling you that they, they want you there, that you belong, then they need to see you for you, right? And all of us are, we have so many different layers, right? And so a part of that is owning that, but again, doing the work outside of the public, right? And it starts with you. All right. Um, Alrighty. I, <laughs> so I just wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, of course say thank you to Dr. Worthy for sharing her time and experiences with our students today. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that today's event is part of the Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement. And this is only one of a series um, of events throughout the semester as well. And so 
uh, Dr. Worthy has posted their information on the screen that you are more than welcome to access and um, check out. As well, to learn more about upcoming events, be sure to check out our events calendar, which has been included in the chat. Um, I'd also like to extend a big thank you to everyone who attended and participated. We hope that you were able to gain a lot from today's event. And lastly, you will receive a feedback form um, and a follow-up email. And we encourage you to fill it out with any feedback you might have so that we can continue to put on events that serve your needs um, and interest students as well. So again, with that, thank you everyone. Stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful rest of your day. A round of applause to Dr. Worthy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you all for having me.